Lecture number four, Paticca Samupada, Dependent Arising. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambhadasa. The subject of this talk is Paticca Samupada, Dependent Arising. The Pali word Paticca Samupada is a compound of two words. The first, Paticca means depending on, because of, conditioned by. The other word, samupada, means arising, but not a simple arising. The prefix sam suggests the idea of complexity, of the interconnectedness, interconnectedness or interrelatedness characterizing the process of arising. So for this reason, a really satisfactory translation of the term would be ha- perhaps be dependent co-arising. But we follow the more usual translation and render it dependent arising. Other translators sometimes use dependent origination, condition co-production, condition genesis, and so on. The doctrine of dependent arising is, so to speak, the dynamic counterpoint, counterpart of the doctrine of anatta, of selflessness. And the great importance of this teaching can be seen from several suttas spoken by the Buddha. In one sutta, the Buddha says, that one who sees dependent arising sees the Dhamma, and one who sees the Dhamma sees dependent arising. The Dhamma is the truth discovered by the Buddha, the truth that subsists by itself, independent of all other influences. And in this statement, the Buddha makes an explicit equation between this profound truth he has realized and dependent arising. Again, it is said in some other suttas, in the description of his own quest for enlightenment, the Buddha says that immediately before his enlightenment, when he was sitting in meditation, he began inquiring into the chain of conditions, seeking the causal origination of suffering. And this inquiry led him to the discovery of dependent arising. So from one angle, we can equate the discovery of dependent arising with the attainment of enlightenment itself. Then the Buddha says, after his enlightenment, he sat for several weeks meditating on dependent arising, meditating on the sequence forwards and backwards. And when he emerged from his meditation, then he reflected that this Dhamma that I have discovered is deep, difficult to see, difficult to understand. It's sublime, peaceful, beyond the range of reasoning, abstruse, to be realized inwardly by the wise. Then the Buddha thinks that it will be very difficult to teach this doctrine because it will be hard for people to see and to understand the truth that is dependent arising. Another time, this is given in the Mahanidana Sutta of the Diga Nikaya, the 15th Sutta of the Diga Nikaya. The Buddha's attendant, the Venerable Ananda, comes to the Buddha and he says, Bhante, sir, even though this doctrine of dependent arising is said to be very deep, to myself it seems very clear and very obvious. And its appearance also, it also appears very, very clear and obvious. When this was said, the Buddha replied, he said, Ananda, do not speak in this way. Mahevang Ananda. Do not speak in this way. This dependent arising is deep, 
in truth and it's deep in its appearance. It is through not understanding, through not penetrating this dhamma of dependent arising, that all living beings, this generation of living beings has become entangled like a matted ball of thread, become like grass and rushes, unable to pass beyond the woeful states of existence and samsara, the cycle of existence. So dependent arising is not only the content of the Buddha's enlightenment, not only the content of the Dhamma, but it is also the truth that has to be realized to gain liberation. It is through not seeing and understanding dependent arising that we have wandered and roamed in the cycle of birth and death, and it is by penetrating to the truth of dependent arising that we are to gain freedom, liberation from the cycle of birth and death. So we can see that the essence of the Buddha's teaching lies precisely in dependent arising, the key not only to an intellectual understanding of the Dhamma, but to the attainment of liberation. Now, the teaching of dependent arising has two aspects. One aspect is an abstract principle, what we can call a structural principle. The second aspect is the application of that principle to the problem, which is the main concern of the Buddha's teaching, the problem of suffering. In its abstract form, as the structural principle, dependent arising is the most fundamental law underlying every process and event that can occur. It is a law that is beginningless and endless, a law which has no external ground and requires no external support. This law, which sustains every event that occurs, the structural principle that underlies all phenomena. This is the law of conditionality. It is the law that holds that whatever arises, arises in dependence on condition. Everything that comes into being, comes into being through the force of conditions. Everything that exists, exists in dependence on conditions. And without the support of the appropriate conditions, the given phenomena will not be able to arise and will not be able to remain in existence. The structural principle is expressed by an ancient Pali formula, which is so basic and so important that we've set it out in the sheet in the Pali itself. The formula runs, he must min sati idang hoti, he must upada idang upajati, he must min asati idang nahoti, he must niroda idang nirujati. The meaning, when there is this, that comes to be. With the arising of this, that arises. When there is not this, that does not come to be. With the seizing of this, that ceases. The first part of the formula, the positive part, explains the conditional arising of phenomena. It says that in order for any factor B to come into existence, its condition A must exist or be operative that B arises through the contribution of its condition A. To give an example, the apple tree exists in dependence on the apple seed. If there is an apple seed, the apple tree can come into existence. If an apple seed comes into being, the tree can come into being. But if there is no condition present, when the condition A for the occurrence of something B does not exist, 
then the phenomena B will not exist. That is, when B exists in dependence on A, then with the absence of A, B will not occur, and if A ceases, then B will cease. Thus, coming back to the apple tree, if there is no apple seed, then there can't be any tree. And if the seed is destroyed, then there can be no growth of the apple tree. For the tree B depends on the seed A. The principle of dependent arising is the law of the conditioned arising of phenomena. And this law embraces all existing phenomena, everything from a particle of dust to a whole world system from a fleeting thought to a whole empire or civilization. Everything that is put together, that's compounded, comes into existence only through its appropriate conditions. And if the conditions do not exist, then the phenomena will not exist. Now, this law of conditionality, this is not the creation of the Buddha. It is a law that's always operative, In a sutta, in the Sangyutta Nikaya, the Buddha says that whether whether enlightened ones arise or do not arise, this law remains, this structuring principle of phenomena, that all compounded things come into being in dependence on their conditions. This principle of conditionality the Buddha calls actual reality, katata. He says it is unvariable, unalterable. It's the fundamental principle that underlies the occurrence of every event. The principle of conditionality expressed as dependent arising. This differs significantly from the Western idea of cause and effect. Sometimes the two are equated, or it's sometimes, sometimes the term Patita Samupada is translated as causality. But that is somewhat misleading since there are certain important differences between dependent arising and the Western notion of causality. First of all, we should mention that the Buddhist conception of dependent arising does not recognize a single cause. Phenomena do not arise only from one cause, but from many conditions. The Western conception of causality works with the idea of a succession of events. One is a cause, the other is an effect. The effect in turn becomes a cause, giving rise to still another effect. And the whole series moves forward in one direction, one event after another. The two cause and effect are depicted as succeeding one another in a straight line. But the Buddhist model of conditionality works with the notion of a complex, interrelated network of conditions. Events linked together, somewhat like the ripples of water on a pond, or like the fibers of a spider's web. They are links in a network rather than points along a straight line. And in the Buddhist idea of conditionality, no phenomena arises from a single cause. For any phenomena to arise, it must arise from many conditions, from many causal factors working together in a functional integration. And then any phenomena which comes into being through these many conditions itself conditions the arising of many other phenomena so that each causal factor has not only one effect but many effects. For example, the apple tree doesn't arise only from the seed. The seed is the main condition, but it also requires soil, water, sunshine, fertilizer, and so on. Then the apple tree in turn has many effects. It gives rise, for one thing, to many apples. Those many apples each contain many seeds, and each of these seeds, in turn, can become the source for 
another apple tree which will give rise to still many more apples. Thus, from many causes come many effects. Each effect, in turn, becomes a cause giving rise to many other effects. And this whole complex interlocking net of events has no first cause. This is a significant difference from traditional Western ways of thinking. Usually we think that the chain of cause and effect needs a first cause, and theistic religions identify that first cause with God, who creates the universe through his will and thereby sets the whole wheel revolving. But from the Buddhist standpoint, there is no first cause to the process of conditionality. No original beginning. The succession of causes and conditions revolves without any conceivable beginning, without any discoverable first point. The process has been going on through beginningless time without any bounds or limits to its sphere of operation. Now, the Buddha did not teach dependent arising merely as a theory as a speculative notion for the purpose of discussion and debate, but rather he presents the teaching because it is central to the aim of his Dhamma, that is, deliverance from suffering. Suffering in its deepest aspect, as we saw, is the intrinsic unsatisfactoriness of the round of existence of samsara, the cycle of birth and death through which we have been wandering through beginningless time. The aim and goal of the teaching, that is the cessation of suffering, liberation from dukkha, and that comes by bringing an end to samsara, to the wheel of becoming. Now the Buddha says that a first point to samsara cannot be discovered. No matter how far back we might go in time, we always find the possibility of going back further. Thus, a first point to the cycle of existence cannot be discovered. However, even though samsara doesn't have a beginning in time, it does have a distinct genetic structure, a causal structure, it is sustained and kept in motion by a precise set of conditions. These conditions the Buddha sets out in a sequence of 12 factors. And these make up the practical side of his teaching on dependent arising. The 12 factors are given on the sheet. They are ignorance, volitional formations, consciousness, mentality, materiality, the six sense faculties, contact, feeling, craving, clinging, existence, birth, and aging and death. Aging and death, though two are grouped together as one. These 12 factors, these are the spokes of the wheel of existence. And these factors are all to be found within ourselves, in our own minds, in our own experience. It is through these factors that we revolve over and over in samsara, we continue to roam in the round of becoming, meeting with the different forms of suffering, with sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. And because of our ignorance of these factors, because of our ignorance of dependent arising, we continue to be held in bondage. And by discovering this truth, the truth of dependent arising, it becomes possible to remove the fundamental links and thereby to reach true and lasting freedom, 
to bring the whole process of repeated becoming of birth and death to a standstill. Now the twelve factors of dependent arising are set forth by the Buddha in a series of statements. These statements have as their basic formula in the order of arising with A as condition B arises. Then the Buddha fills us in with each of these factors so that we have with ignorance as condition the volitional formations arise or dependent on ignorance the volitional formations arise. Dependent on the volitional formations, consciousness arises. Dependent on consciousness, mentality, materiality arises. Dependent on, materi- on mentality, materiality, the six sense faculties arise. Dependent on the sense faculties, contact arises. Independence on contact, feeling arises. Independent on feeling, craving arises. Independence on craving, clinging arises. Independence on clinging, existence arises. Independence on existence, birth arises. Independence on birth, there arises aging and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. Such, the Buddha says, such is the arising of this whole mass of suffering. Now, to clarify the working of the 12 factors, the factors are usually distributed over three successive lives that can be applied to any series of three lives in sequence. Now, if we take the main portion from consciousness number three through existence number ten, we take this portion as applying to the present life, then the first two links, first two factors, will pertain to the past life, to the immediately preceding existence. Then the middle factors from consciousness to existence belong to the present life. And the last two factors, birth and aging and death, those will represent the coming life the future existence. When we say this, though, it has to be pointed out as a precaution that the division of the 12 factors into three lifetimes is made as an expository device for giving a clear explanation of the working of the factors. We shouldn't grasp upon this and take it too literally as meaning that ignorance and and the volitional formations occurred only in the past and do not occur now, or that birth and aging and death are events that will take place only in the future existence and won't occur in the present existence. Of course, aging and death have to occur in this existence too. As we will see as we go along, there is an interconnection or interlocking of these factors. So all of them can actually be found in each single existence. But in order to give a clear, neat, and precise explanation of the causal operation of the cycle of becoming, the Buddha has spread them out, extended them out, and shown how they work over three successive lifetimes. Now we will take as our own starting point of explanation the present existence in which we are living now. This starts with the third factor, consciousness. Our life is a continuum of of experience, a stream of experience in which consciousness is the most fundamental factor. Life begins at conception with a moment of consciousness, a flashing moment of awareness, and consciousness continues all the way through the course of our existence right up to the moment of death. Now the question comes up, what are the conditions that brought us into this present existence? From where does consciousness arise? 
Where have we come from? How have we come into being? And how have we gotten to be the person that we are? That we are? Have we come into being just by chance as a result of material processes, combinations of molecules? Have we come into birth through the will of some creator god? Are we emanations from some divine source? Where have we come from? How have we come into being? This is made clear through the teaching of dependent arising. The Buddha explains that our present life is the result of our past life. We have come into being in this present existence on account of our own ignorance and volitions in the past. Then, in this present life, through our craving, our clinging, our attachment, through our actions or karma, we set rolling the forces that will bring about a new existence in the future, new birth followed by aging and death. Thus the process of becoming is something which repeats itself over and over. It is driven by our ignorance and our craving, shaped by our thoughts, our decisions, our desires and actions. The Buddha starts the sequence of factors with ignorance, avijja. In our past life, our minds were obscured by a basic ignorance. No first point can be found to this ignorance. No matter how far back we go through our past lives, we always find that our minds have been obscured by ignorance. And what is this ignorance? The Buddha defines ignorance as not knowing and not seeing the four noble truths. The truth of suffering, its origin, its cessation, and the way to its cessation. Ignorance does not mean mere lack of conceptual knowledge of the four noble truths. Perhaps in the past we were great Buddhist scholars. We had thorough knowledge of all the Buddhist scriptures. This doesn't mean that we had true understanding of the Four Noble Truths, the liberating knowledge of the truth. Ignorance is a spiritual blindness concerning the Four Noble Truths. It means not seeing not fathoming, not understanding the four truths in their depth and in their range. It is usually represented in the pictures of dependent arising, represented by a blind old woman stumbling along with the aid of a stick. It is ignorance is a kind of blindness, a spiritual blindness, which is covered over our minds and caused us to see things in a distorted manner, it's given rise to various conceptual and perceptual distortions which prevent us from understanding things as they really are. The ignorance is without any conceivable beginning. Throughout beginningless time, our minds, covered over by ignorance, have led us to see things as being permanent, pleasurable, attractive, and self prevented us from seeing them in their real characteristics of impermanence, suffering, and selflessness. And out of this ignorance come all the other defilements, all the other unwholesome mental states, greed, aversion, pride, wrong views, jealousy, selfishness, anger, and so on. All of these are grounded in ignorance. Ignorance is not the first cause of things. This has to be emphasize. Ignorance, too, has conditions. It arises through conditions. It arises as a factor in the minds of living beings. And as a mental factor, it depends on the minds and bodies of beings. And in turn, it leads to the re-arising of those beings. Thus, the process of becoming turns as a wheel, around and around. But ignorance, though it arises through conditions, ignorance is always itself 
the most fundamental condition, the most basic condition of all the others. And therefore, the Buddha takes it as the starting point of explanation. And though ignorance was active in the past and brought us into the present, we shouldn't think that ignorance was left behind in the past. As long as we lack perfect insight into the Four Noble Truths, into the Dhamma, then ignorance remains in our mind. It continues to lurk in our mind, leading us into actions which bring about renewed birth in the future. Now, because of this ignorance, we engage in action. And this brings us to the first proposition, which connects together the first two factors. In Pali, avijja pachaya sankara, independence upon ignorance, volitional formations arise. That is, in dependence upon the mental blindness, spiritual blindness, we engage in actions, actions grounded on our illusions and our wrong views. We activate our will. We form determinations of will. We engage in occasions of action. All of these volitional actions, these volitional formations, these are called sankharas. The word sankhara means forming, constructing, creating, putting together. And here it refers specifically to the mental formation, formations of will that arise in a mind that's covered over by abhijja, by ignorance. The factor of sankharas, this is equivalent to karma. The word karma means volitional action, acts of will which might be expressed outwardly through the body as when we perform bodily action, which might be expressed verbally as speech, that is, verbal karma, or actions which might remain in the mind when we make decisions form plans, arouse desires, think different thoughts, and so on. All of these activities of volition, whether they're expressed outwardly through body or speech, or whether they remain inwardly in the mind, these are the volitional formations, the sankharas. Now, when the mind of a person is encompassed by ignorance, and when he performs some volitional action, then that action gives rise to formation and it gets deposited in the mind as a kind of seed with a potency, a power of germinating in the future and of producing results. They might germinate in this in the future in this present life or they might germinate in the next life or they might germinate in some future existence after that, even after many aeons. But whenever there's a volitional action that arises in a mind encompassed by ignorance, then that action leaves an imprint on the mind, a formation, with the capacity to mature, to fructify in the future. Now, in the present context of dependent arising, the most important aspect of the volitional formation is their power to cross over the gap created by death and to generate a new existence in the future. That is, the volitional formations underlaid by ignorance have a power to bring about rebirth. These Volitional formations that produce rebirth, these can be of two kinds. They can be wholesome volitions or unwholesome volitions. Kusala or akusala. The wholesome volitions are morally pure or good volitions. The unwholesome volitions are the morally blameworthy, bad or harmful volitions. Each kind of volition brings about a different type of rebirth. The wholesome volitions bring a good rebirth. The unwholesome ones bring a bad rebirth. 
But both types of volition, the wholesome and the unwholesome ones, are both conditioned by ignorance. They both arise out of ignorance and both sustain the will of becoming. They both keep the will of existence in motion. Now we come to the next link in the series. Sankara Pachaya Vinyanam, that is, with the volitional formations as condition, consciousness arises. Now, when the volitional formations are accumulated in the mind and ignorance is still present, then when death occurs, a new moment of consciousness will be generated right after death, the first moment of consciousness of the new life. From the Buddha's perspective, consciousness is not regarded as a single persisting entity, a cell for a soul which continues unchanged. Consciousness is seen rather as a series of acts of consciousness, each one arising and breaking up like the waves of the ocean. When death comes, the last act of consciousness of that life arises and passes away. But through the force of ignorance, and the force of the volitional formation, the final process of consciousness generates out of itself a new act of consciousness which springs up in the mother's womb, links up with the fertilized ovum, and starts the new existence. This act of consciousness, the first act of consciousness of the present life, the act of consciousness which occurs at the moment of conception. This first act of consciousness is conditioned by the past volitional formation. It is given its form or its shape by those volitional formations. This first moment of consciousness occurring at the moment of conception this is called the patisandhichitta, which means the relinking consciousness. And it is called the relinking consciousness because it links together the old existence with the new one, the past life with the present life, the new being, new person with his entire past. That is, this rebirth consciousness functions as the vehicle for the transmission of all the past experience, all the past karma. And the reason why this rebirth consciousness springs up is because of the wholesome and the unwholesome volitions that were performed and stored up in the past life. If the karma or volition that determines rebirth is, an, is a wholesome one, then there will follow a favorable state of rebirth with a superior type of relinking consciousness. If the rebirth determining volition is an unwholesome one, then there will take place a lower type of rebirth with an inferior type of relink relinking consciousness. But whether it be a high or low rebirth, that rebirth will be determined or conditioned by the volitional formations that are underlaid by ignorance, by the spiritual blindness. One brief moment, then it breaks up and stops. But immediately after the rebirth consciousness, the same basic type of consciousness continues to flow in as a series or sequence of mental acts throughout the entire lifetime. It flows as a series of subliminal acts of consciousness, a passive flow of consciousness underlying all of our active states of mind, continuing all the ways from the moment following rebirth through to the moment of death. This passive flow of consciousness is called the bhavanga, the
stream of existence or the life continuum. And this Pavanga consciousness, this also is determined by the volitional formations of the past life. Now we come to the next link in the series, Vijnana Pachaya Nama Rupan, with consciousness as condition, mentality and materiality arises. Mentality, materiality, Nama Rupa, that is equivalent to the psychophysical organism. Now, when the rebirth consciousness springs up at the moment of conception, it doesn't arise in isolation. It occurs in association with the totality of the psychophysical organism that also comes into being at the moment of conception. That psychophysical organism is what is intended by Nama Rupa. Nama we translate as mentali- mentality, the mental factors, and rupa as materiality, the material or physical factors. Now, we've explained previously that a being, a living being, is a compound of the five aggregates, the panchakanda, material form, feeling, perception, mental formations, and consciousness. These five aggregates are always present on every occasion of experience. In fact, these five aggregates constitute the experience itself. Now, among the five aggregates, at the moment of conception, the rebirth consciousness is present as the aggregate of consciousness. And when that rebirth consciousness springs up, It is associated with the other four aggregates. The material form aggregate is represented by materiality, rupa, the body of the newborn organism, in the case of a human rebirth by the single fertilized egg. There's just this one fertilized cell, and now that cell is functioning as the physical basis of a living organism. Then, on the mental side, associated with the rebirth consciousness, the other three aggregates are found. Feeling, perception, the, and the mental formation. These make up nama, mentality. So at the very moment of rebirth, there will be present, even in that one-celled fertilized egg, there will be present a distinct feeling a perception, and several mental formations. And this complex of the five aggregates of consciousness and nama rupa, consciousness and the rest of the psychophysical organism, this continues as an organized totality all the way through till death, inseparable, all the factors dependent on one another. Thus, at the moment of conception, there comes into being a living being, complete with all five aggregates. Then we come to the next link. Nama Rupa Pachaya Salayatana. That is, with mentality, materiality as condition, the six sense faculties arise. Now, as the psychophysical organism grows and evolves, as it matures, there come into being the sense faculties. The sense faculties are six in number. There's the five physical sense organs, the eye, ear, nose, tongue, and body. Then there's the mind faculty, that is, consciousness considered as the organ of thought of ideas, of conceptualization. In order to cognize images, ideas, concepts, as well as the other sense data, the mind functions as a faculty of cognition. So we have these six sense faculties. 
which come into being conditioned by nama rupa, by the psychophysical organism. At the moment of conception itself, there is present the body faculty, the body as a sense faculty. And the mind base, the mind faculty is also present, functioning as the rebirth consciousness. Then, as the organism evolves in the embryonic period, the other four sense faculties begin to take shape as the cell multiplies and divides and takes on more specialized functions, then the eye, ear, nose, and tongue emerge. And as they emerge, they make possible sense experience through those faculties. The body itself also becomes more complex and differentiated in this period. And then, coming to the next sequence, the next link, salai atana pachaya paso, that is conditioned by the six sense faculties, contact arises. Now to explain contact, we first have to say a few more words about the six sense faculties. The sense faculties serve as the means for gathering information about the world information which enables us to survive, to function, to fulfill our purposes. Each faculty can receive the type of sense datum appropriate to itself. The eye receives forms, the ear sounds, the nose smells, the tongue tastes, the body tangible. The mind can deal with the objects of the other senses and also with its own kind of objects ideas, concepts, abstract notions, and so on. Now, conditioned by these six sense faculties, contact arises. And what is meant by this contact? Contact is the coming together of the particular type of consciousness with the appropriate sense object through the sense faculty. Independence on the eye and forms visual consciousness arises. Independence on the ear and sounds, hearing consciousness arises. And so forth, independence on the mind and mind objects, mind or thought consciousness arises. The coming together of consciousness with the sense object through the sense faculty, that is contact. Contact is the conjunction or union of consciousness, object, and organ. Through the eye, consciousness contacts forms. Through the ear, it contacts sound. Through the nose, it contacts smells. Through the tongue, it contacts taste. Through the body, tangibles. Through the mind faculty, it contacts ideas. Thus, there are these six kinds of contact corresponding to the six sense faculties. Then, Pasapachaya Vedana, independence on contact, feeling arises. Feeling arises conditioned by contact. Now, feeling, Vedana, that is the affective tone by which the mind experiences the object. And there can be six kinds of feeling as determined by the organ through which the feeling arises. There's feeling born of eye contact, feeling born of ear contact, feeling born of nose contact, feeling born of tongue contact, feeling born of body contact, feeling born of mind contact. And by way of its affective quality, the feeling can be of three kinds. There's pleasant feeling, agreeable feeling, then there's painful feeling or disagreeable feeling. Then there's indifferent feeling or neutral feeling. Why do these feelings arise? They arise because we have the psychophysical organism with its six sense faculties through which our minds contact the six kinds of sense objects. 
and some feeling is present on every occasion of experience. Whenever we see a sight, hear a sound, etc., some feeling is present, coloring our experience of the object. Sometimes the feeling might be faint and indistinct, but it is present all the same at every moment. And it's through those feelings especially that our past karmas work themselves out, that they bring their fruit. Now, with feeling as condition, we come here now to the next link, Vedana Pachaya Tanha. With feeling as condition, craving arises. And with this link, we take a major step forward in the movement of the wheel of existence. For all the factors that we've mentioned from consciousness through feeling, consciousness, nama rupa, the six sense faculties, contact and feeling, these represent the results of past karma, the maturation of our past volitional formation, which we performed or accumulated in the past life and which are now germinating in the present and producing their fruit. As a result of our past ignorance and volitions, we've taken birth, acquired this body with its sense organs, and experienced the different kinds of feelings. All this comes about as a result of causes sown in the past. But now, with the arising of craving, we make a move from the resultant sequence of the past, having its effects in the present, to the causes operating in the present, generating a new existence in the future. In dependence on feeling, there arises craving. When our minds are covered over by ignorance and we experience pleasurable feelings, we become attached to those feelings. We enjoy them, relish them, and we crave for a continuation of this experience for a repetition of it, a renewal of it. Thus craving arises, desiring or holding on to pleasure into the future. When we experience painful feelings, this pain awakens an aversion, a desire to eradicate the source of pain, to run away from it and smother it by indulging in more pleasurable sensations. And so, with the mind covered over by ignorance, the deluded person gets caught in the pattern of running away from pain and running in pursuit of pleasure. The pattern spelled out by craving. But this pattern by which feeling leads into craving, this does not occur as a matter of strict necessity. This is a very, very important point that we come to. Between feeling and craving, there is a space, a space which can become the battlefield where the round of existence, samsara, can be brought to an end. It is here in this space between feeling and craving that the battle will be fought which will be which will determine whether bondage will continue indefinitely into the future or whether it will be replaced by enlightenment and liberation. For if instead of yielding to craving, to the driving thirst for pleasure, if a person contemplates with mindfulness and awareness the nature of feeling and understands these feelings as they are, then he can prevent craving from crystallizing and solidifying. He can prevent craving, craving from arising and from sustaining renewed existence in the future. By employing wisdom, we can stop the process of becoming right at that point where feeling arises preventing it from issuing and further craving and in renewed existence. So the link between feeling and craving, that is the vital meeting ground of the
present sequence rooted in the past and the present causal sequence leading into the future. And it's here that the work of achieving liberation has to take place. This is the battleground where the defilements, the enemy, will be met by the army of the Enlightenment practice. But now we're dealing with the forward movement of the round. And so we continue. Craving has arisen. Now is the next step we have Tanha Pachaya Upadana. That is, independence upon craving, clinging arises. What is this clinging? Clinging Upadana is an intensification of craving. And the text distinguish four types of clinging. One is clinging to sense pleasure. That is, we cling to the pleasurable feelings that arise and we cling to the objects that give rise to these pleasures. The second type of clinging is clinging to views. We cling to our theories, to our opinions, to our conceptions, to our beliefs. We set up a scheme of categories through which we try to interpret reality to ourselves, to make things intelligible to ourselves. We hold and grasp that scheme. The third type of clinging is clinging to rules and observances. We cling to various precepts. We cling to rituals to ascetic practices, whatever, with the notion that just following these rules blindly, performing these rituals blindly, that that's going to lead us to salvation. Of course, the rules might be important, the precepts necessary, the rituals might be helpful. The mistake lies in clinging to them with wrong views, with misunderstanding. Then the fourth type of clinging, the most fundamental type of clinging, this is the clinging to the notion of an ego entity, clinging to our mind and body as being a self or the belongings of a self. Now, clinging arises out of craving. And the difference between craving and clinging, this is illustrated by a simile. Craving, they say, Craving is like a thief extending his hand to grasp some object that he intends to steal. Clinging, that is like the thief taking hold of the object, taking possession of the object. So at the stage of craving, the person is reaching out for the enjoyable object or for the idea or notion that he demands and needs. At the stage of clinging, he grasps hold of that object or that set of ideas and he's appropriating it for himself. Then we come to the next sequence. Upadana Pachaya Bhava. That is, independence upon clinging, existence arises. Existence comes into being conditioned by clinging. What is meant here by existence? Bhava is the comically accumulative side of existence. The phase of life in which we act, in which we accumulate karma, in which we generate more volitional formation, wholesome and unwholesome. The phase in which we build up these formations, accumulate them in the flow of consciousness, Store them away in the ongoing flow of consciousness. When these karmas are accumulated through craving and clinging, then after death these karmas bring about a new existence in the future. That is, bhava pachaya jati. Independence upon existence, birth takes place through the karmically accumulative side of existence, through our stored-up karmas, driven by craving and clinging, after death we reappear 
of the stream of becoming goes on, taking a new birth. That new existence in the future begins with birth. That is given here as the eleventh factor, jati. This future birth is to be brought about by the present craving, clinging, and the karmic accumulation. And birth in the strict philosophical sense consists in the future manifestation of the five aggregates, a rebirth consciousness together with nama rupa, the mental and material factors. Then, in dependence on birth, then we have jati pachaya jara marana. In dependence on birth, there arises aging and death. That is, because we take birth in the future, then we have to pay the inevitable price. We have to undergo aging and death. And some of the texts mention not only aging and death, but sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. And despair. So those are the 12 factors of dependent arising. And now we have some, having set out and explained the 12 factors, there are some additional considerations to be given to them. First, there is what is called the three links. These are quite obvious from what we've already said and need not be discussed at length. We can see them in the diagram. First, there is the link between the past causes and the present effects. That is the link between volitional formation and consciousness. Second, there is the link between the present effects and the present causes. This is the link between seven and eight, healing and craving. And thirdly, there is the link between the present causes and the future effects, between 10 and 11, existence and birth. The most important of these, as we mentioned, is the connection between the seventh and the eighth, between feeling and craving. Then the twelve factors are arranged into four groups with twenty modes. We saw that the causal factors of the past are ignorance and volitional formation. But when there is ignorance present, there is also craving and clinging. Craving and clinging don't belong only to the present life, but when in the past life, when our mind was covered over by ignorance, we also had craving and clinging. And so, and so along with ignorance in the past, we also had craving and clinging. Then the volitional formations, in effect, are the same thing as existence. Existence indicates the comically accumulative side of life, and the predominant aspect of this side of life is the formation of karma through volition. So the two items, volitional formations and existence, these are really the same thing shown under different names and assigned to different lives. But when one is mentioned, the other is also implied. So then we get as causes in the past along with the ignorance and the volitional formations, we have craving, clinging, and existence. These are the five causes in the past. Then in the present life, with the present effects, we have five Consciousness, men mentality, materiality, the sense faculties, contact, and feeling. Those are subject to birth, aging, and death. So birth, aging, and death are implicitly included. Then in the present causal section, when we have craving and clinging, what lies behind these? Ignorance. The reason we crave and cling to things is because we are ignorant about the true nature of things. 
And so when craving and clinging are mentioned, then ignorance is also implied. Then, as we said, existence is equivalent to the volitional formation. So thus, al- thus along with the three in the present, we have up two other causes, that is, ignorance and volitional formation. Thus, we have five causes in the present. Then birth, aging, and death are events pertaining to consciousness, to the factors consciousness through feeling. That is, it's consciousness and the mental and material factors that are born. There's these that grow up, these that mature, these that grow old, and these that die. So when we speak of birth, aging, and death, we're referring to the factors consciousness and the material and mental state, including the senses, contact, and feeling. In that way, we get five effects in the future. Thus, we have these four groups, the five past causes which give rise to the present effects, then the present five causes which give rise to four more to which give rise to five more effects in the future. Thus we get four groups with twenty modes. And this whole sequence can be seen as repeating itself over and over again. You could apply it to any sequence of life. The twelve factors are again subdivided in another way, into the three phases of the round. First, we have the phase of defilement, kilesavakta, that is, ignorance, craving, and clinging, the defiling mental factors. Then, from this defiling phase, because the mind is ignorant, craves, and clings, the person engages in actions that bring about an accumulation of karma, Act karma which is productive of more existence in the future. Thus, this phase of karma functions as the cause for the third phase of the round, the phase of results. The phase of karma that includes the volitional formations in existence, numbers 2 to 10, that issues in the phase of results, which includes the other seven factors, as shown on the sheet. All the resultant factors from consciousness through to feeling and then birth, aging, and death. All of this comes about as the effect or result of karma built up in the previous existence, and that karma is motivated by the defilement. These three phases of the round function in a cyclical pattern. Defilements issue in karma, and karma issues in results. Defilement of the general cause for renewed existence, comma, the specific cause. This new existence becomes the basis for more defilement, because of which we generate still more karma and produce still another existence in the future. That is the, the basic genetic pattern, the reproductive pattern of samsara. That's why it continues over and over. But now there is one catch to this whole process of repeated existence. There is a way to bring this whole samsara to an end. The process of repeated existence doesn't have to continue. It all hinges upon a single underlying root. That root is ignorance. And it was the discovery of the Buddha, the most discovered, striking discovery of his enlightenment that ignorance can be eliminated that ignorance can be overcome it is possible to generate a kind of knowledge an understanding of the true nature of phenomena an understanding which breaks through all the screens of delusions and distortions a knowledge which sees phenomena as they really are. And by arousing this knowledge, this realization, the wisdom of enlightenment, ignorance can be eradicated. 
ignorance can be eclipsed and annihilated. Then, with the cessation of ignorance, volitional formations come to an end. The liberated person, the arahant, acts. He's not completely passive. He uses his will. He decides things, chooses, performs actions. But his acts of volition do not harden and solidify into volitional formation. They remain as mere functions or activities of the will without getting deposited in the mind as accumulation, as hardened formation. His volitions lose their potency of bringing about renewed existence in the future. The volitions of an ordinary person, of an unenlightened person, these can be compared to footprints left in wet cement. When the cement hardens, the footprints are retained. But the volitions of the liberated one, the arahant, these are like the tracks of birds flying through the sky. No trace remains. His volitions don't harden into formation. In the Dhammapada, the Buddha says of the arahant, he says, those who do not accumulate, who have understood the nature of food, whose object is the void and unconditioned liberation, their track is hard to trace, like that of birds in the sky. Because he has aroused the wisdom of enlightenment, the arahant, the liberated one, has eliminated ignorance and no longer forms volitional formation. Thus, with the cessation of ignorance, the volitional formation sees. And because he's reached enlightenment, he no longer has any craving for renewed existence. And so when he reaches the end of his lifetime, there is no precipitation of a rebirth consciousness. With the cessation of the volitional formation, the process of consciousness ceases. With the cessation of consciousness, there is no new mentality materiality, no psychophysical organism coming into being in the future. With the cessation of the psychophysical organism, there is no more sense faculties, no more contact, no more feeling. Since there is no more feeling, there is no more craving, no more clinging, no more accumulations of karma, no birth, and with the ending of birth, there's no more aging and death. All the dukkha, the suffering of the round, comes to an end. That is the cessation of suffering, the ending of the round. Now, turning to the practical implications of this teaching for our own practice, as we said, the most important factor is the link between feeling and craving. That is why the Buddha singles out craving as the origin of suffering in the Four Noble Truths. And so in terms of our own practice, what we have to do is to prevent feelings, the feelings that we undergo from leading us into craving. And what is needed to do this, to prevent feeling from leading into craving, is mindfulness and clear comprehension of the feeling. We have to be mindful and clearly aware of the feelings that arise associated with our sense experience and not buy into them, hold to them and cling to them. If we lack the mindfulness and understanding then when pleasant feeling arises, there will issue in craving. We relish the object, become attached to it, and desire more of the pleasure it gives. But if we have mindfulness, then we become aware a pleasant feeling has arisen. We stop at the awareness of the pleasant feeling without succumbing to it, without allowing the defilements to cluster around it. 
then applying wisdom to our mindfulness, we understand the feeling is impermanent, unsatisfactory, without a self, insubstantial, merely an impersonal, egoless process. These measures prevent the feeling from giving rise to craving. Then as we go on cultivating wisdom, wisdom grows sharper and sharper, deeper and deeper, until it cuts off the basic ignorance, or cuts off layer after layer of ignorance. And when all the ignorance is eliminated, then the state of liberation can be achieved.